Today, we are uh, going to listen to Mr. Neil Mellon. Neil is an expert on uh, Micronesia and um, the problems associated with, uh, the, that are happening in Hawaii. And um, before we start, though, I want everyone to know a term that's going to pop up uh, in the presentation. It's called uh, uh, freely associated states. So in the presentation, you're going to see FAS, or freely associated states. That's talking about Micronesia, the Republic of Palau, and the Marshall Islands. So whenever you see FAS, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, also, I want to thank uh, the Peter and Debbie Martin Foundation for helping to sponsor this event and uh, acknowledge uh, the Maui mayor, Alan Arakawa, is here with his wife, so thank you for coming. And uh, the governor's uh, representative is also here, so thank you for coming as well. Uh, and also, Face Maui is here as well, to my knowledge. So, Okay, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Neil Mellon. Thank you very much for coming. Can you hear me in the back? Or would you prefer that I use a mic? OK. Joe really wants me to use the microphone. OK. Thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, obviously, you're giving your time to be here uh, about something that, uh, for some folks, is, is a, a very personal topic, and for others, is, is a new topic. Uh, for me, it's a topic that I feel very strongly about. And so I'm just grateful for you that you cared enough to come and listen. And um, as uh, uh, Joe uh, might have mentioned, uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to be a, a Peace Corps volunteer in Micronesia, classroom teacher, for three years. And when I returned back to the States, like many former Peace Corps volunteers, I wanted to maintain a connection with people that I really valued and experiences that I treasured. And so along with some other Peace Corps volunteers, I set up a small nonprofit uh, that uh, attempts to help students in Micronesia um, as, as they try to navigate, you know, the, the educational system and, you know, define their sense of the good and, and pursue it. And in the process of both being a classroom teacher in Micronesia and certainly in setting up a charity to continue to, to try to support students in Micronesia, I always encountered this huge disconnect that over the last few years, I've had the, the pleasure of, of investigating further pleasure, it, it's frustrating, that on one hand, Micronesia is this place that, on the face of it, receives so much support from America. And on the other hand, I was teaching in classrooms and, and working with, with students that faced such challenges. And it, it always confused me that the greatest, biggest, wealthiest nation on earth could have been working to try to improve things in Micronesia for 70 years and still have this situation that was so frustrating. And so when the Grassroots Institute asked me to come and talk about homelessness, I think that I, I thought a lot about their name, Grassroots, and, 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 it, and I thought about what are the foundational, the most basic level reasons that we might be even talking about homelessness among Micronesians here in Hawaii. And so I am gonna talk, and my comments are going to, in that sense, be directed towards the very foundational issues here um, that I think really need to be considered in terms of addressing homelessness as just one symptom of the challenges that Micronesians face. This is a, a picture of a young girl. She's in an outer island, in this case of the state of Yap. It's a, so, some, something of a representative uh, building structure. It's made of some plywood and some wood with some local materials mixed in uh, and some tin roofing there on top. When we talk about homelessness among Micronesians or, or FAS migrants, it's important to, to place this in, in a series of causes or a series of, of, of um, interrelated issues. And, and for me, I, I think about that in terms of four things. First and foremost, lack of opportunity within the freely associated states. Secondly, the fact that those confronted with this lack of opportunity can very easily come to the United States. Third is the fact that those individuals looking to better themselves by coming here are immediately faced with 
some significant disadvantages compared to other people in, in the population. And then finally, one of the things that, that really is the case as well is that they are also faced with some very enormous cost of living issues that, that just have to do with the specifics of state and local policies here in Hawaii. And so for me, the, the frustration, as we'll see, is, is that the U.S. has invested all this money. Micronesians are, are not having needs met among certain issues. They pick up and leave, and then they find barriers in those same areas here in Hawaii. And these, group, these folks who are trying to better themselves are, are sort of going through a second round of challenges. So real brief, by means of background, Micronesia is also a term for a region, a third, if you will, of the Pacific. It means many small islands. And over the centuries, it has been something of a minor chess piece in the back and forth between the great powers and uh, a big area in the map that has changed colors many times over the years. For a lot of people here on Hawaii, uh, the story begins, if you will, in December of 1941, and that is when Japan, which at this point controlled or owned, if you will, all of Micronesia, except the U.S. base on Guam, was able to both launch an attack on Hawaii as well as uh, seize Guam because it had control of Micronesia and had built out infrastructure within it. After the war, U.S. policy was that we would not allow another foreign power to dominate this strategic area in the Pacific, and Micronesia was run as, as something of a de facto colony. It was a trust territory run by the U.S., authorized by the U.N. And that lasted until the late 70s and early 80s. And the goal had been to prepare Micronesians to sort of govern themselves and be economically and politically self-sufficient. That goal hadn't really been realized. Uh, so the United States essentially developed and helped lay the groundwork for this transition to independent sovereign nations. But the details of that were obviously heavily influenced by the American history as well as the the uh, American bureaucrats who were working in the process. And these three independent countries, called the Freely Associated States, became nations. And they were called the Freely Associated States because they each entered into an agreement with the United States called a Compact of Free Association. Now, it's worth noting one of the reasons why we are, as a country, still talking and very interested about this is, is that just as the Japanese in the late 1880s and 90s developed a plan that involved strategic control of islands encircling their homelands, the Chinese have, have something of a similar vision. This is an interesting picture. Uh, it's also of a, an outer island. I think this one might be in Chuuk. This is the literal physical remnants of the Second World War. These are items that were left over either Japanese or later American. Uh, obviously, the U.S. pulls out, and, and, and a great deal of actual stuff was there, a, a small indication of, of, of the violence and the presence that occurred during those years. Many people do not realize that Micronesia receives more foreign aid per capita than any other countries on the planet. If we just look at the numbers, you have more than $230 million for a population of 200,000 people, and that $230 million comes in the form of direct bilateral government-to-government -government payments. In addition to that, there are eligibilities for U.S. programs, which means just as a public school perhaps here might be able to apply to the U.S. Department of Education for a special education grant, many schools in Micronesia could similarly apply whether it's a program through the Department of Education or Energy or Commerce, that is not calculated within the 230. There's also a lot of shared and subsidized services. So much of the Micronesian Post Office, for example, operates essentially as a de facto U.S. postal operation. Uh, the airspace is controlled by the FAA. So this is why a lot of people think of Micronesia as sort of the 51st state. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it involves a huge amount of money. And the key to that money is that it is entirely controlled by the Department of Interior. Now, every other country on the planet 
besides these three, interact with America through the State Department. Those are our professional diplomats, the State Department, right? And these three countries are independent countries. They're sovereign nations. And so the precedent that would dictate would be that they would be mediated that relationship by the State Department. And the State Department, which has experience in helping development and, and political evolution in, in, in other developing countries, would be able to use its expertise to help. But what has happened is all this money and this relationship is controlled by a very tiny portion of the Office of, in, of uh, uh, Insular Affairs, which is this little speck within the Department of Interior. And the reason that they do this is because they've always done it. Okay, so when the Navy starts leaving Micronesia in the mid-40s, and Micronesia is supposed to be this trust territory controlled by the U.S., someone said, well, gosh, these guys at Interior, they did such a good job with the Native Americans, we'll send them out to the Pacific. And so they ran for 35 years this region as a trust territory. They were at the table and helped author the compact and set up these governments. And then because they always had... They continued to, through the power of the purse, essentially control much of life in Micronesia. And it's important to note that their approach has simply been to say, we have these programs and policies and designs in the U.S., we're just going to give them to the Micronesians. Okay? So if we have a model of public schools that is based on this sort of 1950s Dewey-influenced suburban public school district model, and it works really well in the suburbs of Chicago, let's just pick it up and give it to the Micronesians and drop it out there. And, and, and maybe the conditions are really different and the size is really different, but we're just going to do it. And then we're going to fund it just like it's a suburban school district in, in Illinois. And then we're going to be really surprised when, and we all know schools in Illinois are really not that good anyway, it does nothing for the Micronesians except cost a ton of money and make them really frustrated. So... This is an interesting little picture. Uh, for me, it's very representative. This is, uh, this is in Colonia in Yap. And, you know, very pretty. We've got some dense, uh, some trees and some plants. But what's significant for me is these are very simple, not, not in the best condition, cinder block buildings. And what these are is these are government buildings. So somebody wakes up in the morning, They've got their little car over there that's actually given by the government of Japan. There are other countries besides the U.S. that give some aid. They drive into this government building. They've got a nine-to-five job, right? Remember, their grandparents may have been subsistence fishermen or, or weavers or, you know, these sorts of things. But now they've got this nine-to-five government job in this sort of drab building. It's, you know, needs some maintenance. And, and unfortunately, this is the lion's share of the Micronesian economy, Right? Because America, especially the Department of Interior, was not investing in a long-term plan that involved foreign direct investment and creating capital and providing jobs and sustainable growth. It was invested in building out the apparatus through Department of Interior of large bureaucratic systems that mirrored ours. And so meanwhile, this is uh, someone, I think, in a, an outer island or a lagoon island of Chuuk. This is a residential situation. You can see they're getting their water. Infrastructure has not been built out. They're getting their water off the roof. They got bananas, food source, right next to the house. You got someone over there in the cooking section. You can't really see because of the light. Doesn't look as good as the government building, which itself didn't look so great. And so what has happened? You have had Micronesians who under the Compact of Free Association, are allowed to come into the United States, who have migrated, and many have come to Hawaii. And we know that in the last count in 2013, there were almost 15,000 Micronesian migrants. These are people who were born in the Freely Associated States and came, because if they have children here, those are US citizens. The state of Hawaii has said that it costs $100 million per year to provide these migrants with goods and services. Because if they send their kids to public schools or if they get on basic healthcare Hawaii or, or draw government services, 
local and state governments are paying for it, and they've said, we need, we need the money to, to, to pay for this, right? Because the, the federal government allows these folks to come, they come here, and it costs money, so you know, we need some help. So Department of Interior said, oh, okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. So we're gonna write you these checks every year. It's called Compact Impact, and it's supposed to offset the costs. Uh, but what has happened is the amount of money that Hawaii claims they're spending, our money, taxpayers' money, versus the amount of money that the federal government's reimbursing, it's about 16 cents on the dollar. So that is obviously a big trouble. The second thing that personally troubles me is, is that this is a really static way to look at it. Because I know that when people come in and engage in economic activity, buying things, working, we have payroll tax, we have sales tax, we have, there are net gains for everyone, right? And that's not being quantified. And that's, unfortunately, that's not why Interior is not paying everything back. It's just, this is how Interior operates. They're, you know, it's sort of, sort of disconnected from what's really going on. So what about homelessness among those Micronesians who come? Sadly, there is not a lot of data. There are only, as I see it, two reliable, consistent indicators, and I'm gonna tell you what both of them are. The first, is the fact that 15% of individuals who receive rehousing, housing, or outreach services from the homeless and housing providers in Hawaii report themselves to be Micronesian. Okay, so think about what that means because it's a really specific claim. There are nonprofits and government entities that provide services for homelessness. They take in demographic data about the people who receive services. They report every year on that data, and they say that 15% of those who receive services are, home, are Micronesian. That doesn't mean that 15% of homeless are Micronesians. All that is saying is 15% of people who go and receive services self-identify as Micronesian. That's produced by the United, uh, uh, University of Hawaii Center on the Family. It's an annual report, so you can see year to year, but that label, level's pretty steady. If you think about, as a point of contrast, what percentage of all people on Hawaii self-identify as Micronesian, 1%, you're gonna say, okay, disproportionate, disproportionate. The second data bit, the indicator, is that of Micronesian families surveyed, and this was also a, a government study here in Hawaii, of Micronesian families surveyed, 16% reported themselves to either be homeless or living in a homeless shelter. Now, once again, if you look at the you know, estimated homelessness rate among all people on Hawaii, out of proportion, because it's, it's less than 1%. So, how do we get to those alarming indicators? Well, first we have lack of opportunity within the freely associated states, mostly as a function of poor foreign policy aid programs. Then we have easy entry into the United States, which is one of the tenets of the compact. Once these Micronesians arrive, they're gonna be at a competitive disadvantage compared to other members in the community. We're gonna talk about what that means. And then of course, they're gonna just deal with the, the, the hard reality of this is a very expensive place to live. So what about within the freely associated states? Micronesians who come to Hawaii and who leave Micronesia always report there's three reasons why. Employment, education, and healthcare. So what's going on in Micronesia that they're coming and out of their home islands looking for education, employment, and healthcare? Well, that $230 million that is given annually by the Department of Interior accounts for half of all local, state, and federal government revenues within those three countries. It accounts for 40% of gross domestic product. And it's a third of all jobs. Again, this is year-to-year -year aid payments. In the case of Federated States of Micronesia, it is half of all jobs. So there is very limited economic activity in these countries outside of the year-to-year -year government grants. We have been in Micronesia for 70 years, and we have not developed any private sector economy and we have made it very difficult for entrepreneurial, ambitious Micronesians to set up economic activity privately.
So I'm not the only person who's observed this and said, you know, something's going wrong. Uh, Department of Interior itself in a 2003 report said, well, we didn't make any significant progress over the last 20 years towards the goals of self-sufficiency. And the Government Accountability Office, who's a little, little less biased, you know, went further and said, you know, honestly, there's just, there's just limited prospects for achieving any type of economic growth on the trajectory that we're on. Yes, sir. So I'm saying there's very little, and one alarming indicator is the fact that year-to-year -year government aid, just from the Department of Interior, is, is comprising 40% of all gross domestic product, and in some cases, half of all cash economy jobs. So we talked about, we talked about schools. This is a good example. This is the entire student population of a small elementary school, grade one through eight. And the, the, the really interesting thing for me about this school was, again, it was modeled on the public school district model in the US, which involves several layers of administration, governance, and a huge emphasis on certain types of inputs. So I, I actually taught at this school. And one of the things that always surprised me is, is at any given time there were a lot, there was always at least one educator at the school who was off island getting training. And I, I would always say, you know, how come you're at this training thing? You know, what's, what's going on? Is that really helping you teach in the classroom? And they would say things like, well, you know, uh, we heard from the state capitol that, you know, the U.S. federal government now has these additional criteria where we need this, these extra training things to sign off on in order for us to get funding this year. And, and, you know, I thought about my friends teaching back in the States who sort of grumbled about those types of requirements but might be able to take the class online and, then, and get it. And, and the point was the design, the efforts were being totally driven by these, these responses of, of the Micronesian education system to meet up with these indicators and these input criteria of, of frankly, the U.S. federal government and Department of Education. And, in, in, and that did not give them the autonomy to build a system of instruction that was really what their kids needed for the reality of their life, right? So there was, and remains, for example, precious little technical vocation. There were one or two schools, there was a great Jesuit school called Pats and Picks, and these were schools that were entirely private funded, that were teaching uh, you know, vocational skills that there was a great demand for, but U.S. Department of Education, Department of Interior, dumping tens of millions of dollars every year and just not teaching what people needed to learn or what they wanted to learn. Oh, just uh, so that guy there, the blue, he's the principal. Great guy, great guy. Um, uh, he, was, he was frustrated. He was frustrated. He had to write. So number two in our, our chain of events is Micronesians have an, a relatively easy pathway to come into the United States. When these compact of free associations were signed and we said, we're gonna give all this financial aid over several decades and hope that you transition to self-sufficiency, there was a clause in there that said, even when the financial payments end, Micronesians can come to the US easily. They don't need a visa, they don't need the sort of things that the folks from other countries would need. They can stay and they can work and go to school. And I think the idea was, yeah, you're gonna have a certain number of folks who kinda of come, they're gonna to go to school or get maybe complex medical care or something and, and kinda of go back. But the, the rational, the reasonable response to many Micronesians to this lack of opportunity in the US, uh, in the FAS, is you could come and, and throw your hat in and, and try, try living in the United States. And so when, when Micronesians come, they are called either eligible non-citizens or qualified non-citizens. And essentially what it means is they, they can't own a gun or vote in an election, but by almost every other measure, they're an American. Right? They still have a foreign passport, um, and, it's, and it's incredibly difficult for them to actually get citizenship in the U.S., which is really baffling. If you're going to give them de facto citizenship, you're going you're to make it hard to become a real citizen. Their kids are obviously going to be, if they're born here, U.S. citizens. And again, when these folks are asked, why did you guys come? Education, employment, health care. The same thing Department of Interior is spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to promote in Micronesia. This is inside of our classroom. When it starts raining a lot, you have to stop because it comes down on the tin roof, makes a lot of noise. Light comes from the outside. So you can imagine that that's a big factor. 
Um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's obviously designed to be sort of roughly like an American public school system classroom, because that's what we had, so we're just going to give it to them. So when Micronesians come, the sad irony is, is the fact that they, were, they lacked opportunity in education, employment, and healthcare means that when they arrive here to escape that, they are actually immediately disadvantaged along those same sorts of lines. Okay? So they often come with lower levels of educational attainment because the, the, the public school system in, in Micronesia that we fund, that's a sad result. They tend to have very few marketable job skills. If you've been a semi-subsistence fisherman and you're really good at it and you come here and you, unless you're applying for a job to go spearfishing all day, uh, what are you going to put on your resume, right? Wealth and savings, right? A lot of them spent many years to earn the money to buy the plane ticket. They're not coming and saying, well, we saved up enough money that I got six months before I have to find a job. You know, that's just not always the case. And of course, language and cultural fluency. For a lot of Micronesians who come here, you have to remember, English may be their third language. They have one language that they lived with and grew up with, and because each island speaks slightly different languages and dialects, they might have another language that other family members use, and then they have English. Um, and for cultural reasons, a lot of those who do speak English very well may not be assertive about it. And so it might give someone who's not Micronesian the sense that maybe they don't have the language skills. And that's, that's a cultural gap. That's not a language gap. So we talked about cultural assimilations. So especially if you were from one of the smaller villages or one of the more remote, distant outer island, Lagoon Islands, this is your big city that you came through on your way to Hawaii, right? So imagine when you get to Hawaii, and this was the big scary city, you know, you're, you're kind of not ready for things. You're, you may not be very well prepared. Yeah, this is also a, another sad sort of glimpse at this is the big city that American aid has created, right? Do you see a lot of, a lot of vibrant economic activity or, or investment there? Um, you don't see any buildings going real tall because, uh, well, honestly, because of, of private property issues. So one of the things the Department of Interior did really early on is they said, on one hand, we're going to give the Micronesians these systems. We're going to give them free market enterprise. We're going to give them representative democracy. We're going to give them all this stuff that America has. But a lot of the early folks in the interior were very concerned, not with the native culture, but I think with their perception of the native culture. And so, for example, early on they said, well, you know, there are these very complex native traditions about land ownership. We don't always really understand them. We're going to work really hard to preserve them, okay? But then you're also over here saying, we want to have economic activity. We want to have investment. We want to have growth. If you don't have private property rights, and all you have is land, and you can't get a loan for it because you don't have clear title and you don't have an education process, you're not going to be able to get a loan to start a business. And this is one of those things where Department of Interior de-emphasized land reform. They were against it, against private property rights. Then when the Micronesian constitutions were written, it was inserted in that there wouldn't be clear, there wouldn't be foreign ownership of land. And then U.S. Congress sort of adds it in. And then we wonder, how come there isn't economic activity? How come we're not seeing uh, investment and, and, and capitalization based on land wealth? Well, structurally, it just can't happen. So those, those Micronesians who come here... Oh, yes. So he asked about international commerce. They are independent countries. They could certainly you know, engage in international commerce. Uh, the fact that they have this close relationship with the U.S. doesn't prohibit them from doing anything. In terms of, you know, natural resources, obviously you got, you know, fishing and some other things like that. Certainly the isolation and the scale is, is, is sort of a, a natural limitation. But the idea that isolation and scale are, are so bad that we sort of shouldn't try is, 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 I think, something that Department of Interior and others have slipped into, and it's a real misnomer. So your Micronesian, lack of opportunity in Micronesia, easy entry to the U.S., arrive here, competitive disadvantage. In Hawaii, the extra unfortunate layer is enormous cost of living. There was a great study of Micronesians in Hawaii a few years back, um, and what they found is, is that a lot of the stereotypes I think that some folks have of Micronesians in Hawaii are not exactly right. So the first thing they found is the average household size was four members, 
which is you know, more consistent, I think, with the mainland idea of a nuclear family than this stereotype of a lot of Micronesians all crowded living together. It's just not, not what they found. That, that family had a median income of $42,000. And in the family, on average, one in three individuals were going to school and one in two were working. So you're looking at a family of four, mom and dad are both working, earning an average of $9 an hour, and they are struggling with almost $1,000 a month in rent. And, and when, when the researchers sort of dived into the employment situation, one of the Micronesians very, very sort of tellingly said, unemployment's not a problem for Micronesians because we will take the jobs that nobody else wants. But even when that's happening, Right? And they're taking those jobs because they don't have the educational attainment and the professional background maybe to take some of those higher paying jobs. Even as they're taking these jobs, they're struggling with the high cost of living. So people have asked, why would the Micronesians choose Hawaii if the cost of living and some of these other conditions are, are sort of rough? Long story short, what they said is, in their view, these were Micronesians who were interviewed, they feel the comfort they felt in living in Hawaii as an island and what that means in terms of the climate and, and the people offset some of those cost of living challenges. So what can be done? I am not here to say we should change the Compact to Free Association and not let Micronesians in. I believe America has a strong strategic interest in Micronesia and we should instead fix the problem that causes Micronesians to feel like their only option is to come here. And in doing so, if Micronesians still want to come here, I think that's great. We will have better prepared them for life here when they arrive, while also giving them better alternatives back home. So I think we need to improve education, healthcare, and employment opportunities. That gives islanders the reason to remain if they choose, or they're better equipped to come if they prefer. What does that mean? We need to end government-to-government -government aid with policies that promote sustainable economic development in Micronesia. That means foreign direct investment. That means businesses opening that can provide people jobs and economic mobility. I think that we can do that by guaranteeing US private sector investment. I think that we need to support the development of nonprofits in Micronesia. There are virtually no domestic nonprofits in Micronesia. Compared to even any other developing country, there are precious few nonprofits. The faith community is one area where there's activity going on, but it is, it, is, it is in need of help. And Department of Interior has not provided that. They have not made those investments. And I do think that there needs to be perhaps still some government to government aid, but it needs to be more realistic, more directing, and it cannot crowd out private sector economic activity. I think it's reasonable to condition some of that aid on reforms to a rule of law and private property. Right now, in Micronesia, the, the world ease of business rankings, they are some of the hardest places on the planet to open a business. And so it should not be surprising that if it's very hard to open a business, it takes several years, it costs a lot of money, it's very complex, not a lot of Micronesians are going to be entrepreneurs and pursue that in the Federated States or, or the other FAS countries. I think we simply need to get rid of the Department of Interior. I don't think there's any justification for them being the mediators of this relationship with these independent countries. I think simply changing will communicate to the Micronesians that we value them as independent sovereign countries. And I think we need to change the fact that if a Micronesian comes here under the compact, they uh, essentially cannot become a citizen even though they're a de facto citizen. If they stay here, if they have kids, I think that giving them a, a, path, a clearer path to citizenship, it's going to help with assimilation, and frankly, it's going to cut costs for compact impact because the status of those folks will be U.S. citizens. So this is, uh, this is one of the precious few nonprofits that exist. This is, this is WAGE. It is a group of Outer Island boys who were getting into trouble after school and a group of old men from the Outer Island who still knew how to carve canoes and sail them around and were worried that nobody would remember that when they died. And when this group got set up, they, they came, they came to, to Habile, our little charity. They didn't know what to do. 
there were no nonprofits around. There was no model for what do we set up? What's a nonprofit? What does that look like legally? What's a board of governance? What are conflict of interest? How do we raise money? We had been there for 70 years and had not taught them what civil society was. And so setting up this NGO was incredibly difficult. And just as an interesting aside, so our little charity sponsored them. And, you know, I went out there once and, and these boys are making these canoes. And I, I was trying to say, you know, what you're doing is really important. You know, that people outside here really value this. And they thought, you know, oh, these people in the big cities and the big buildings, they wouldn't care about this. I said, I, I, bet, I bet you they will. I will show you that they care about this. And so what we did is, uh, Habele actually found someone who wanted a Micronesian canoe. This uh, eccentric rich guy in Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina, it took me three years because of all the red tape. But we got a canoe to uh, this guy who lives on the Edisto River in a plantation outside of Charleston. And I went back and I told those boys, I said, did you know that guy paid you know, $7,500 for the canoe, it blew their mind. Like, That's as much as a car. He can't go anywhere in that thing. And I said, no, you have expertise. Markets are about finding people who value that and assigning value to it. This nonprofit perhaps could be sustaining itself by selling canoes, right? But it is so complex and, the, and, 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 and so time consuming that that's just at this point may not be even a realistic possibility. So, you might be sitting here and say, okay, I'm getting the big picture, the problem with homelessness in Micronesia traces back to, uh, in Hawaii, traces back to these ground conditions in Micronesia. What about here in Hawaii? I see, I see some, some folks over at this table especially. What, what's gonna happen here in Hawaii that we can do about it? Well, you're not the federal government. You, you can't change out the COFA, I get that. Okay. There are changes that you can make in these communities that will benefit all low-income people and in the process will probably benefit Micronesians more than anyone else because they, in addition to being low income, have these other challenges. Those are things like lowering the minimum wage so that more people can get entry level jobs, reforming zoning and use regulations, which drives down property prices and drives down rent, reducing payroll taxes so people with entry level jobs bring home more of the money that they earn, Eliminating barriers to hiring new folks, especially at small businesses that drive the economy. And there are other policies like school choice that might allow Micronesians to make good choices among different schools so they can choose the school that's gonna be best for their kid, especially if that kid has English as a second language or other challenges that make them more complex and more costly to educate. There are some Micronesians who might want to go home and the plane ticket might be the problem. I think if that is the case, I think having a system in which voluntarily they could get the cost to go back is a reasonable thing. I'm not suggesting that we should seek out, try to find poor Micronesians and send them back, but I think there is some small segment of Micronesians who, given the chance, might choose to. I think there might be legal action against Interior. And I'm gonna give you an example. Interior is responsible to give out about $24 million in the FSM alone every year for infrastructure, buildings. Last couple years, they stopped giving the money because they said they didn't like the projects the Micronesians were selecting and they didn't like the way those things were working. And so they just sort of held back. So two years ago, there was this horrible typhoon, ty Typhoon uh, Maysac came through, decimated a lot of islands. There were some deaths. It was super typhoon, real bad. And what happened is Department of Interior had not been building buildings in accordance with the treaty that they signed. And they didn't start right after the typhoon either. So the Micronesians, and, and I'm just going to just guess, you know, my sense of the culture is they're not going to go to Department of Interior and say, you guys broke the law, you got to give us this. That's, that's sort of not the confrontational style of a lot of Micronesians. But the state of Hawaii felt the impact when a lot of people after the typhoon decided to migrate. This is the time we're finally going to migrate. And so if there's a cost associated with that migration, and Interior withheld the money, it may be the case that there's, there's a, a consequence of that. Yes? Um, I want to stop here, and uh, we, we want to give uh, Mayor Arakawa a chance to read your white paper, which is available on our website, and we want to give her a chance to respond, and then we're going to take a Q&A and learn some more. So, Perfect. Uh, let's give Neil a round of applause. I'm pretty sure that
Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much. Very interesting topic, and um, there are some very important considerations and points, I think, that we all need to look at in the presentation. Just uh, as a little bit of a reference, $230 million is about half their gross income. Maui County is over $650 million. 200,000 is their population, and we're talking three countries here. Maui County is about 168 with tourists over 200,000. So the resources that we have here in our county surpasses the resources that three countries have. Put that in perspective, okay? When we're looking at quality of life and we're looking at what we want to be able to accomplish, I think it's a really big mistake, first of all, judge quality of life by what we conceive of as a highest quality of life, first of all. Because the quality of life is really dependent on how people are brought up and what they're happy with. You know, some people aren't happy unless they have a Cadillac in the garage and they have a 16-story building with 600 rooms and some people are very happy with a one-bedroom cottage and a view of the sunset. So everything has to be put into perspective as to what kind of lifestyle you really like. There are something to be said for a very quiet rural lifestyle. And you notice no big cities, very isolated residential areas, a lot of vegetation. It's comfortable for people that grew up in that kind of a situation. And it's very comfortable as far as the quality of life expectancy. So to interject our um, our quality of life expectancy, I think, is something that we really need to examine because we're not always right in what we want and we can't make up our minds as to what we think is a good quality of life <clears throat> and not a good qu quality of life. Now, I have the opportunity in a lot of what I do to talk to some of the leaders of these countries at a lot of the conferences that I go to. And they definitely do have some major challenges in trying to develop the economies of those communities. But one thing they really don't want is they don't want to be overrun by someone from outside their communities, literally telling them how they should be living and what they should be able to appreciate. So some of the rules and regulations that they have that prohibit a lot of foreign money coming in and literally buying out everything that they have and creating the kind of community that somebody else would like to see developed is not necessarily good for people. And that's something that I think needs to be really looked at carefully before we interject a lot of foreign money. There are a lot of things that can be made a lot better and made much more available if that is the direction that they choose. The school system, the education system, a lot of what we're struggling with here is also something that needs to be improved worldwide. And the reality is that if the students are going to become adults that are going to have to be able to survive in an international situation, they need to also have the opportunities to get educated in a way that would be comparable to make them competitive on an international situation. So the education system is something that most definitely can be improved on, but there are a lot of different ways to be able to improve on those kinds of educational opportunities. So we need to be able to work with some of the people that are in the education field in some of these countries and expose them to a lot of the kinds of things that we have and have them literally select what methodology they want to use to be able to, to work with the students that they have to deal with. Going from Hana to Lanai to Molokai to Kaupo, even here on, in our county, 
we have a lot of different desires as to what kind of education system we want and how people want to be able to create the opportunities for their, for their children. You know, we've got a school in Hana that has about six or seven students that nobody out there wants to close down because that's the kind of education they want. It's one teacher teaching all the kids. Then again, we have teachers that are teaching different things, such as how to construct homes, how to farm, many of which our Department of Education have abandoned to more traditional kind of learning. So when we're looking at our community right now, we're struggling with lack of farmers. We're struggling with a lot of lack of skill level um, graduates because now everybody is expected to get a college degree and become a doctor or an engineer, ignoring the fact that about 60% of our population is needed in many other occupations that don't require college degree. So to try and impose that, I think, is something that really needs to be considered carefully as well. You know, when you look at the economics of our community, a carpenter makes a little bit more than college grads that are teaching. And I use my wife as an example, as a teacher. I have a lot of friends that are contractors that have worked their way up through the, the construction industry that are making a lot more money than she and I combined. So those kinds of occupations are not necessarily to be ignored. The ability to market is something that I think can be worked on jointly and you're seeing a lot of different uh, marketing opportunities creating now that we have international communities. And a lot of our sister city programs, we're uh, discussing how we can market to each other's community and create those business connections and those business entities. And I know that a lot of the leaders are in these countries are looking for the same kind of opportunities, but they want to keep the opportunities within their communities rather than have someone from outside coming in and overwhelming them with real big business, even though it may increase their, their basic economies. I think we have to be careful about some of that. Um, in some areas, you know, we tend to say, well, you know, if you build a hotel, that's a $300 million building and you've got all these people coming in, but at the same time, you lose your beaches, you lose a lot of the place, spaces that the local guys would like to have. And then, you know, we can't go sit at the, sw the swimming pool unless uh, we're a guest at the hotel. So you lose a lot of opportunities. So we have to be able to balance some of those. When trying to analyze how to help groups like the Micronesians, um, it's very different in the analysis than we would normally take when we're looking at people that were born and raised in an American type society. You know, many of my friends that are in these communities literally create compounds so that they're sharing residents, they're sharing living quarters, they're not requiring individual houses for each person or each family. And the lifestyle is very different than what we're doing. The other challenge that you're finding is that the economics is very different as well. The desire to become self-sufficient in producing a lot of what they eat, a lot of what they use, versus how many times we can go to the store and you know how many things can we buy for Christmas? Very, very different. So I'm going to I'm going to, I'll tie it up in a couple of seconds. So what I'm going to suggest is the presentation is is very informative, but keep in mind that when you're dealing with people with a completely different lifestyle and completely different desires overall, then we need to be very careful not to impose what we consider the best lifestyle into their form of living because it could really mess up their way of living. And you see that in a lot of the Asian countries where we've gone in, they've fought wars, and we've started to, to create whole situations, 40-story buildings and, and a lot of traffic. Um, we're seeing more poverty in those kinds of situations because people have been taken away from the 
traditional lifestyles and being forced into an American type lifestyle. And we have to be very careful not to try to impose that kind of hardship. When you look at the American cities right now, almost every city is having a huge problem with homelessness, a huge problem with uh, people that have um, mental and physical challenges not being able to get the proper help. So for us to then impose and say, well, our system is working really well, may not, we may not be the best model to be trying to impose what we think is the best when we can't take care of who we have at home. Being able to have a family type situation may actually be better. Okay, Joe, thank you. Oh, he asked about the transmission of culture generation to generation. This is interesting. The canoe carvers were outer island individuals. So these are the ones who live in these really small, disparate islands, whose families had, for economic reasons, moved into the district centers, okay? So, you know, for purposes of a cash economy job or, or some other reason, or, or healthcare, they had moved into the district centers. And so those families had children who would have identified as, oh, I'm from this outer island, but they grew up in the district center, and, and so they didn't have the outer island lifestyle and background. And so these older men were concerned that the outer island boys who, who hadn't grown up in the outer island, so to speak, would not have had occasion to experience canoe building and sailing in their everyday lives in the way that those young men would have if they still lived in some of the more rural settings. And so canoe voyaging is more vibrant and alive in Micronesia than anywhere else in the world. And I will point out that the canoe voyaging revival in Hawaii, and I get in trouble here with some Hawaiians, was entirely dependent on the fact that some Micronesians, specifically from Setawal, came to Hawaii and retaught re some of the navigational techniques. And, and so canoe carving, and sailing, very vibrant, it receiving a revival across other parts of the Pacific, still a skill set. In this case, for, for, for reasons, those kids didn't have that continuity, and so it was being reestablished. Sir in the back. The population is growing because uh, there is obviously access to healthcare to a degree that we see higher, you know, obviously great thing, lower rates of infant mortality, you know, those sorts of things. There is a, an outlet though, you have to realize it's not a closed system because of the migration. We don't necessarily see that increase in the freely associated states as quickly as it is occurring. So this is tough because of the way things are counted and the fact that for many counts, if that family migrates and then has a kid, the child being a US citizen, for some types of counts, they're not counted as a Micronesian, they're counted as an American. Now that said, the count of one of those countries, the Federated States of Micronesia, that was completed by a PhD here, Levin, and a Jesuit priest, Hiesel, they estimated that there were, across all US jurisdictions, mainland, Hawaii, Guam, nearly as many Micronesians as there were back in Micronesia. They used a, a reading of descendants who were American citizens to mean Micronesia in that count. But the problem is, foundationally, there's just very little data. And so that's why I really wanted to emphasize, I have these two data points, here's what they mean in context. Don't think that that necessarily means something else. You know, but, so let me briefly, if I may, remember that little girl in the very first uh, slide? All right, so that, that really rough typhoon came through. She's going to the public high school, and you know, public high school was not being rebuilt. School's starting up again. Class is not going to start for her. So what's going on? Youngest girl in the family. All the older sisters had had, had kids. The, the brother had gotten married. No one had 
completed community or, or, or college, so there's not, not a good chance she's gonna get a cash economy job. Everyone said she's, she's real, real clever. What a waste of human capital. What a waste of potential. So, Habile, our little, our little modest charity, for less than what the US government spends per pupil in the public school system, we pull her out, we send her a Jesuit high school, the family still pays 20, 25%, so they're invested, making sacrifices. She's going to school. Over this last summer, she came for a cultural exchange. You want to talk about culture shock. You live in an island of 50 people, and then you show up in, in Washington, D.C., right? She took music lessons. She took arts and crafts lessons. She took classes at the uh, transition for the Honors College at University of South Carolina. She took dog training classes, because when she got to the host family's house, she was scared of the dog. It's big, they didn't have a Micronesia. Up here, she's meeting with the congressman from South Carolina, as well as the congresswoman from American Samoa. We said, we want her to meet a strong Pacific Island woman who has accomplished a lot in the US system, and, and to see what the lessons might be there. She, like all the other kids on Habile scholarships, and, and, and let, me just, let me just let you know that her Habile scholarship to go to this Jesuit high school, about $700 for the whole year. Think about that. So we're spending more than 1000 per pupil in the public school system. We got her at one of the best high schools for $700 a year. So one of the things the Habile kids get if they keep their grades up are t-shirts. So she comes and she says, I want to see where the t-shirts are made. Because one of the classes she's taking at the art museum was silk screening. I said, you know, they do this. This is, this is a thing. This is Bertha at the, at the little factory in South Carolina where they make these shirts. And that's the guy who's saying, hey, did you know, I made all this. I decided one day I wanted to have a business and I really like t-shirts. And he told her this story about how he raised money and he got investors and he started hiring people and he made the first shirts by himself. And now he had these guys and this equipment and she's sitting there and I was so excited and then it hit me. We're in this position where he has to, and she is surprised to hear, the basic process of, of human empowerment of starting one's own business. And I'm so excited that she heard that story and that she sees that that's a possibility. And then I just think about all the other Micronesian kids we couldn't sponsor to hear that. And that after 70 years of investment, someone's got to tell a, a bright, ambitious young person what it is to start their own business and to create something and to be able to provide for their family in that way. Um, and so obviously, you know, I'm partial to what we do at Habile, but I feel like it is an example where we have empowered individuals to make decisions for their own lives and, and send them on a trajectory. And I don't think that that's condescending at all. Um, I do think it's very cost effective and I think it's good for both the Micronesians and the US. All right, so I, there were two different questions, and the first is not one that I can answer. There are Micronesians here, hopefully, if, if we'll answer, and that was, you know, sort of, what do you want, right? And, and in regards to the mayor's comment, that's who, he's right. Those are the only people who should be answering that question. I can speak to the second question, which you sort of said, you know, so what would be the point of, of sort of improving education, healthcare, and, and, and employment in, in Micronesia when it comes to 
the Amer America has, a, has an interest, what's our policy agenda out there, and what am I suggesting? So I'm suggesting not that we simply improve those things to meet their desire that they're filled and, and satisfied, so therefore they won't come to America. What I said is, let's improve the situation on the ground in a way that they're interested so that they can either have their, their, their goal achieved, their needs met in Micronesia, or let them still come here, but maybe be a couple steps ahead in that economic ladder of individual advancement. And so I'm not saying we need to just fix the foreign aid and development situation in Micronesia so they'll stop coming. I'm saying we need to fix it because it's a problem in and of itself, and that, that can result in both an improvement of conditions on the ground there as well as, and, and so, Joe, can I let the micro, the, some of our, our friends over there uh, perhaps respond to his first question about, and it, maybe I'm restating it, sort of, you, you kind of said, what is it that the Micronesians, some Micronesians might want out of a reformed, or, or how did you? So that's a great question, and I'm just going to add one other element. Those discussions are occurring ahead of the year 2023, which is the year in which the financial part of this compact ends, but the migration component remains. So I'll tell you what, if I had the two little beautiful girls that I have home in South Carolina and was living in Micronesia, I'd be thinking about it might be time to start planning ahead for whatever's going to happen when the USAID stops. In, I think a rational, ambitious Micronesian might say, maybe it's time to move to Hawaii. So I don't know if there's is someone here that would feel. I'm a Micronesian. I'm sorry to throw this I'm, <laughs> I'm John, John Taibomal. I work with the state of Hawaii. Uh, I spent 20 years in the military, Navy, um, retired, came to Maui. Why Maui? I that's think how he is a native born Micronesian, not a US citizen, who is a veteran of the US military. That is yes. another part of the compact. Just keep that in mind. Sorry to interrupt. You, that's true. You, you don't have to be a US citizen to join the military if you're a citizen of Micronesian. But when you're in the military, that's the only way you can become a US citizen, being in the military. You cannot just apply. If, if any of you have been here for 20 years, you have to go because of the, the, the agreement, the COVA. You have to go back and reapply for the, uh, uh, the same process the Filipino and other uh, citizens of other countries uh, have to go through to become a citizen. Uh, so it's not, being in Hawaii doesn't, uh, make you automatically become a US citizen if you want to. It's, it, you can't, almost impossible, unless you're in the military. Um, to answer a question, to tell you the truth, the government and the people, the older generation, they don't want people to leave. They want people to be there. It's just the choice of the, the younger generation um, because because of the there's no um, secondary education over there. Once you graduate high school, you either fall back into this, your, the community, become a fisherman, or copra collectors, or just married and have children, have five, nine, ten children. Then you stay there. But if you want to go to college, then you go abroad to go to college. Um, so not, uh, not until recently in the 80s that they had the uh, Community College of Micronesia, or uh, College of Micronesia, COM. And uh, in Ponape, one of the, the capital of the Micronesia. Um, And now, recently, they have campuses on every of the four states. 
of Micronesia itself. This is not including Marshall or Palau. Those are Marshall. Marshallese are from Marshall, Marshall Island. Palauans are from Pala Palau, Republic of Palau. Micronesian are from the FSM, the Federal State of Micronesia. So there's really three group of islands there uh, that under the COVA, but they're not all just Micronesian. I mean, there, you, here we refer to, go ahead. Okay, that's cool. Uh, I want to, if you have any final thoughts, but uh, thank you so much for being here. Did you want to wrap up? Yeah, but for, for your question, we just move away. There's people still there, and they pretty much want to be successful staying there. But for those of us that choose to go abroad, for me personally, I want to join the military as a single. I enjoyed going for the adventure. Uh, which I did, and got married in 2003, got kids, my, my older one is 12, and when I retired, I kind of won their future the way not, it is now, in, instead of, rather than taking them back there, and they're gonna be confused, because you, they're US citizens. All my kids are born from different bases in the military, three different bases, um, so it's just easier to let them go to the education here, to the school system here, and grow up here, and whatever happened after I die or something, that's, but they'll eventually go back. But for now, I think I've chosen Maui to be here, and uh, uh, that's where we're, going, where we're going to be. We're not going away, and in fact, we're, we're creating a, me and the, this group right here, these young ladies, we're creating a, a Micronesian uh, organization of Maui, which is MOM, and the FACE uh, organization helping us try to educate people in Hawaii about the Micronesian, but that's, that's a different uh, 